Hello, welcome to Barn Blog Solo. And I want to talk about a theoretical problem that I see a lot of the time that uh, is also a logical problem, which is the assertion that because X social construction or X legal construction is not substantive, it is therefore unreal. Because generational terminology is something that Americans are obsessed with, it is unreal, even though there is a material difference between people born before the baby boom and after it. And it actually altered most of U.S. society, including in terms of wealth distribution and property values. Given that the time you enter the market actually affects property values, it is an economic material distinction. Now, it may not be as substantive as where you are in the circuit of production and where you are in income and wealth, although it affects your probabilistic likelihood of access to wealth. So it is a real socially constructed distinction. It may not be as substantive as other distinctions, such as class or even race or gender. The attempt to reduce con concepts so that the ones that you don't like are unreal because you view them as less substantive is a rhetorical trick that makes your analysis pretty weak. Social construction means that it does not have a non-human reality. But that's true for like most abstract concepts. Abstract concepts are linguistic and thus are subject to social construction. Similarly, I was I got a, asked a question on um, uh, one of my interviews about why I thought public versus private partnerships or public partnerships or private partnerships are real. That is a de jure distinction, meaning it is a distinction of the law. You may think that they are de facto not substantive because many private uh, organizations get public funds, thus there is no real distinction, but that is an issue of substance. The problem is that what you are doing is equivocating the concept of reality here. Reality has a bunch of different meanings. Reality, sometimes in colloquial language, means just substantive, all right? That is a de jure distinction without de facto import. That is an issue of substance. And substance here can be defined as of importance or, or of distinctions that matter. All right? Reality, as a socially constructed abstraction of language, I mean, it is. You know, the totality of reality is not something that you can even speak about directly. All right? Now, I'm, I, you know, we, we might believe that we might have metaphysical concepts that enable us to think that we can talk about it indirectly, and that indirect discussion of reality can have substance. But reality, technically speaking, is the set of all things that exist. Both conceptually and physically. And... How we break down the physical world is tied to how we construct concepts. This is a logical thing. Ancient philosophers came up with all kinds of ways of handling this. The sophists and the nominalists thought that these distinctions were, dis were artificial distinctions of language. Nominalism does believe in the ultimate reality of an ultimate reality. In fact, medieval nominalism believes the ultimate reality is of God itself, which is an undifferentiated totality, both of which the world emerges, but of also of which it is separate. Okay, that is the medieval metaphysical language for nominalism. It's not that they were a nihilist, but that they thought our concepts, our words, could best appropriate reality, and they were linguistic conventions. All right. Now, later on, this metaphysics gets dropped away, and we can talk about like nihilistic nominalism, which doesn't believe that these concepts have any substance. Uh, probabilistic nominalism, etc. 
So when I say public private distinctions are real, I mean that they are legal realities, and that does have sub substance. You may be able to legitimately argue that that substance is not significant enough for it to be a real distinction for you, that it is an illusion of law. But I would like to remind you that such abstract concepts, and law itself is, again, an abstract concept, has the reality of people with guns behind it. So it is real because it is enforceable conceptually. We know what it means. Now, you may say that you know, after a certain point, there's no real distinction between public and private. It's not a substantive distinction that a governmental legal entity and a non-governmental legal entity are still subject to the circuit of, of capital, which you may define as uh, charterless, thus dependent on the government, are, are legalists, which dependent on the conception of law. And those are not the same thing. The money as legal concept versus money as sovereign concept are actually very minorly distinct concepts that people confuse all the time. All right. Now, a lot of academically published continental and even sometimes analytic theory is loose with language in such a way that they will talk about the reality or unreality without parsing these fine distinctions because it seems semantically non-important. But that is a rhetorical move to understand this analytically or even dialectically, because to get your dialectics correct, you actually need to understand the emergent categories as people socially understand them. You need to be able to make the distinction between socially constructed but real, but maybe not particularly substantive versus socially constructed and substantive, meaning that it has effects. This is a lot of the time why I actually say we need to be somewhat nominalistic in our conceptual frameworks because people aren't talking about the same thing. And a lot of very silly political debates and arguments are just people going in circles over and over and over again about the reality or non-reality of X concept are trying to reduce X concept to other X concept, even though they have interrelated but separate social histories and linguistic constructions and patterns and etymologies and genealogies. You cannot make something go away by assuming that the substantive power of the concept, the explanatory power of the concept, and the force of that explanation and its social effects in the real world. Um, reduces or completely invalidates other concepts, particularly when they had the rate of law or social convention that is generally understood and accepted. Now, yes, this means that the reality of many concepts are socially provisional in ways that all kinds of people don't like. Isn't that relativism? It's only relativism metaphysically if you believe that the belief in something conceptually changes the physical reality of the thing arose by any by any other name is still arose it's as an x called y would still be substantively x all right now there is some way in which maybe there is limitations to that the kind of weak form of sapphire warfism which in our concepts do actually matter in our understanding of constructions and you know what you break down as an individual component, all right? Uh, yes, it, like my organs operate in certain ways and and we can break them down in pretty discrete terms. But there are systems of organs and interrelationship between systems of organs that when we say like the circulatory system versus the respiratory system, in some ways they are distinct, like they do separate things, but in some ways they're so interrelated that we could conceptually break them up as one thing, like because oxygen is moved through the circulatory system and the circulatory system is totally interconnected with the respiratory system, etc. Is it medically efficacious to break it up in other ways? Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. All right. Do not be overly wedded to a conceptual apparatus, but do not deny conceptual apparatuses that are well understood as if they just don't exist. 
That is a rhetorical move. It's not a particularly honest one, and people do it all the time. And it's based off of equivocating between what is intersubjectively understood or socially understood and some kind of absolute metaphysical norm that you often are not stating. Or it is one where you think the distinction may be real, but not really particularly important. Legal distinctions, however, are enforced by people with real physical consequences for ignoring sometimes. And the arbitrariness of that application is actually part of the state sovereignty mechanism itself. Who does the law get applied to and who it doesn't matters. But nonetheless, the law, if it can be enforced, is real. And not just enforced necessarily by guns there's also unspoken laws that we all share but if we stop believing in them they no longer exist does that make them unreal well it makes them unreal when we're not enforcing them but when they actually have the weight of social civil force they are very real we understand what they mean in abstract and can operate accordingly Making sure you have these distinctions clear, while it is just literally semantics, semantics does matter. Semantics is about the categories in which you are communicating. Right? Syntax is the structure. Semantics is the categories in their substances and what you are communicated. We can get into pragmatics and semiotics and any other kinds of linguistic concepts if you want me to but this is the distinction here and it's one that is rec that is important for both communicating and language and also for analyzing what people mean when a lot of people say generations are not real they're just marketing categories well marketing categories that are understood are communicative they are real in that sense you can use them or not. You may say they are not substantively meaningful. I would actually disagree on some generational distinctions and not others. Yes, 20-year uh, brackets of cohorts of people being born are largely arbitrary, particularly when they're basically defined by who fought World War II and their children, and then everything else is either extrapolated from that backwards or ahead of that, to like Generation Alpha or whatever, if you're an American. No, they don't apply universally. It is a US centric concept, all right, that does reflect a real material change in US life. And there are analogs to it in Europe and Asia, et cetera. But it, no, we're not really talking about the same thing. Similar red race, constructions of what is and is not whiteness and who is and is not in and out, not just differs between white and non white, but also differs between the particular region you are in and what variables are considered important. That's what we mean by race being socially constructed. It is not that there are not genetic differences between different populations, although the greatest majority of genetic difference is actually in Africa itself. It is that we have constructed based off of social prejudices and are fairly arbitrary morphology, usually somehow tied to some other prior categorization. And in the West, both in the North African West, Asian West, and in the European West and the post-European West, that tends to be out of people who come from religious distinctions that later on are naturalized. But these are substantively real. Just like class and your relationship of power dynamics is substantively real. When you try to assert the reality of a class that has an incoherent definition, the problem is not that like, oh, the abstract form of PMC doesn't exist. The problem is I want a definition that is articulatable and analytically useful and not just your immediate gut biases of the people you dislike. 
So the problem there is not when I, you know, it's not that the category is unreal. Almost all class categories in some sense are unreal. The proletariat is real by people who meet its description in the relationship of production. It is not real as an abstract in space. Otherwise, class abolition would be meaningless anyway. And the conservative gambit, if you're one of the people who are conservative on class issues, is that all classes are necessary because they are somehow ontologically real. That you have your class position from something about you inherently. That is usually the conservative argument. It is not usually stated that way in liberal societies, except when they try to somehow base it off of merit. But nonetheless. All right. So let's get this clear. Substantive is about effects and predictability. Does it lead to things that lead to predictable analysis? Does that analysis align with what we see happening in the world? Do the concept help us parse what happens to the world or not? Are they co internally coherent and clear? Those are substantive things. All right. Reality is a broader concept. Remember, reality is the the set of all things that exist. That's kind of its definition. All right. Now we may mean physically real or conceptually real or legally real. And maybe we should be more careful and always adding the controlling domain to that concept. The legal reality of X versus the economic reality of X, etc. Then we can have a debate, but to just talk about real and unreal an abstract like that usually leads to equivocations, miscommunication, and conceptual muddledness. And conceptual muddledness may be rhetorically useful, but it is rarely ever analytically useful and means that you should be able to think through it. All right. I hope that clarifies some things for you. Have a great day. Like and subscribe. We have a Patreon. You can join for as little as $3. Um, help us out. I produce tons of educational content. Most of it is available for free on YouTube. Some of it is available for free and long form podcasts. Some of it is not. And um, we also run book groups and additional reading discussions and stuff like that in our Discord, which you get access to as a Patreon, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Have a great day. Like and subscribe. Review, comment, argue with me. Sometimes I'll respond. Sometimes I won't. Have a great, uh, have a good time. And again, thank you.